Hey, we're glad to see everybody today and, and glad to have you here. Boy, isn't it great to see everybody together? Isn't it great that God can just bring us all together? I don't know what kind of baggage you've got. I don't know what kind of garbage you're carrying through life, but just lay it down. Amen. Lay it down and relax and let's enjoy each other and let's enjoy being in the wonderful presence of God. And uh, he might even show you a way to kind of unload some of that stuff. And that would be a really good thing. Hey, we've all got baggage, don't we? Yeah, we've all got it. If, if you've got baggage, you're at the right place. God will take care of it, and we'll help you to deal with it. If you're perfect and you've got all your life together and everything, let us know that too. We'll pray for you because uh, you may need more help than those of us with baggage. So uh, just keep that in mind. It's great to be together. It's great to be together, and we thank you for it. We want to welcome you to our church family. You know, we, we have... We have four things we try to do as a church. We, we want to we learn the truth. We want to feel the love. We want to seek the Lord. And we want to what? Serve him. We want to seek the lost and serve the Lord. That's really the, you want to know what the mission statement of, of a church is? This should be it. This should be it. We want to learn the truth, feel the love, seek the lost, and, lo and serve the Lord. What else do we need to do? You do all, hey, if you can get all that right, you're in good shape. You're in good shape. Would you join me? Uh, one of the things we do as a church, if you're visiting with us, is we confess our faith together. We're not ashamed of that. We take the Lord's Supper together. We pray together. We sing together. We study together. We confess our, our Lord together. Would you join me, please? I am a child of God. I'm saved by grace. I live each day by faith. I'm ready to hear God's word. As we go to the word, please stand. Another weird thing this church does is that we stand when God's word is read because where else should our honor go than to the, to the, the Lord of the universe who communicates to us? Our reading this morning is from Acts 10 as we study through the first 12 chapters of Acts, these windows, pictures of the early church. This is a continuation of a story we began last Sunday with a preacher named Peter and a seeker after God named Cornelius. Peter has been called to go to Cornelius. Cornelius has been called by God to seek Peter out. And so the story picks up. The next day, Peter started out with them. These are Cornelius' servants. And some of the brothers from Joppa went along. And the following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visiting. But. God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objections. Now may I ask, why have you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour all th at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. And so I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. And then Peter began to speak. Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God really does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what, what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. 
He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he's the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. May God bless this reading of his word and his people said, and amen. Kids, we want to dismiss you if you would like to go for your Bible class. We have a class for all of our kids through, I think, fifth grade, if I'm right. All right, there we go. Okay, have we got that squared up? Got people giving directions, telling this and that and stuff. That's okay. We appreciate you being here. Tommy was talking in Bible class about how he was worried about his time in the half marathon. I can tell you how to resolve that problem. Don't run it. If you don't run it, you don't have all that stress. It's like I was telling Mark Ledford. You know, Mark Ledford was talking about doing a job and getting poison ivy because of it. I said, that's why I don't work. You know, you talk to people who work, they're always complaining. They've pulled a muscle, they got something wrong with them, their back hurts, they're, you know. Don't go there. You stay away from that stuff. It's bad for you. Anyway. It's good to have you with us. We're going to be honoring our seniors in a little bit. We're so proud of what they've accomplished. And, you know, they've got a long way to go, and, and they know that. You know, we, we remind them, oh, you're entering the big world. And, hey, you know, most of our kids have already figured that out. They've already gotten out there enough that they know kind of that the rules change, and uh, you have to change with them. But our prayers are with them. We've got great teenagers in this church, and we pray that every one of them will be blessed by God. And we've got great little kids, and we want to see them grow up to be good teenagers and great adults. So let's do some work together. I want to share with you a lesson called A Message for All Men. And the reason it's for all men is because it really is. This is the first time that the gospel has been presented in the book of Acts as a universal message. It's always been intended for all men. When Jesus left this earth, the last thing he told his disciples was that he wanted them to be witnesses all over the world. The last thing Jesus said before he left the earth was go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the nations, make disciples of all the nations. Well, it's taken them ten chapters to get there. Because they began in Jerusalem. The church began in Acts 2 in Jerusalem. By Acts 7, it's rolling pretty good. God boots them out of Jerusalem, and they start going in 8 and 9 into Samaria, just north of Jerusalem. They go into Galilee. They spread throughout Judea, the province around Jerusalem. But there's still, there's still Jews preaching to Jews. Jews converted to Jesus trying to convert Jews to Jesus. The problem is Jews make up about 1% of the world back then. The other 99% are called Gentiles. The goyim we noticed last week, the outsiders, or as the Jews like to call them, the dogs. They were despised by the Jews. Jews wouldn't walk on the same side of the street. They wouldn't visit their house. They wouldn't invite one in. They wouldn't talk to one. They loathed the Gentiles. They saw them as paganistic, vile, immoral, nasty people. Even the ones who were like Cornelius, seekers after God. It's all right to seek God, but don't try to do it with Jews. The problem is until Jesus came into the world, the only ones who really knew God were the Jews. And so the, the rest of the world was just shut out. That wasn't Jesus' plan. Jesus died for all men. Jesus died for everybody's sins, and that included Cornelius. And so in the first couple of verses, of, or the first 23 verses of Acts 10, we see God shifting things around a little bit to get the right people 
in the right places with the other right people so that he could open the door wide open to the Gentile world. And it's interesting that although God had in chapter 9 called Saul, the converted Jew, the converted Jewish zealot and persecutor of the church, God had brought him to Jesus and had pronounced him as the missionary of the church to the Gentiles. It's interesting that the man whom God calls to convert the first Gentile is not Saul, but good old Apostle Peter, to whom God had said in Matthew 18, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. I'm going to give you the keys. I'm going to let you unlock the gates. And so who preached the sermon on the first day of Pentecost? Peter. Who went up to Samaria to welcome the Samaritans into the kingdom? Peter. So guess who's going to show up at Cornelius' house? Peter. And so you get interesting things as we set our stage. Two cities are involved, both on the coast of Israel. One to the south, the little city of Joppa. We know it today as the city of Jaffa or Jaffa. Uh, just north of there, about 30 miles, is the modern-day ruins of the magnificent ancient Roman city of Caesarea. It is an archaeological site. It is one of the largest archaeological sites in the modern world. It is a beautiful, magnificent place. Um, it was, it was uh, you talk about overkill, it was a case of architectural overkill. Herod built this magnificent, did you know that Caesarea doesn't even have its own harbor? Herod the Great, when he built the city, created an artificial harbor. They managed to pour concrete blocks the size of that section of the building right there. There are about 20 of them underwater in Caesarea today. About the size, I mean, gigantic, massive blocks. And they created a breakwater with a gate in the middle of it and created its own harbor. And then he named the city after his friend Augustus Caesar, which made the city even more disgusting to the Jews since they hated the Romans. So all of these things are coming into play. This Roman, this this uh, Italian foreigner, this dog to the Jews' way of thinking, has become, I guess because of living around Palestine, he's come to know the God of the Bible. And he believes in God, and he, he, he kind of loves God in his heart, and he wants to serve God the best he can. And so he prays three times a day just like the Jews do. There's no indication he ever converted to Judaism, but he prayed three times a day just like the Jews did. He, uh, he gave generously to the poor. He was a good moral man. I mean, he just, you know, he was everything but a Christian. He was, if there's an unbelieving Christian, he was it. I mean, he was the, the ideal example of a good moral man. And he, he was praying to God and praying to God and praying to God, always saying, God, show me where you want me to go. Show me how you want to live. And, God, and you know, be careful what you ask for. He asked God to show him what to do, and so God says, okay, I'll do that. Comes to him in a vision one day and says, okay, that down in Joppa, down 30 miles south of here, there's a man named Simon the Tanner, and there's a guy in his house named Peter, Petros. I want you to send down to Joppa, and I want you to fetch that guy and bring him up here, and he's going to tell you what to do. Now, God didn't convert him in a vision. He sent him a Christian. It's the way God converts people. He sends Christians to him. That's why we as Christians always need to be alert to the fact that God may be sending somebody your way just to bring to Jesus. Amen. So, he gathers a couple of his men, sends them down to Joppa. Well, at the same time, the, the scene changes, and you got Peter. He's visiting this guy Simon down in Joppa. He's up praying one afternoon, and God sends him a vision. He's hungry. God sends him a vision. This sheet comes down. It's full of all kinds of food, and by Jewish law, Half the food on the sheet was okay. Half the food on the, on the sheet was forbidden, was forbidden. No, 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 no. I mean, he not only had, you know, the good Jewish kind of food that you're supposed to eat, but it also had, you know, like uh, pork chops and pulled pork barbecue and stuff like that. Stuff we like, but that's because, you know, <laughs> we're Gentiles and we eat that stuff. But Jews couldn't eat that. They had catfish fried with hush puppies. 
And it also had that salad that they put the vinegar in that's that, 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 that uh, what is it, cabbage salad with the vinegar. In. Yeah, it's good stuff. Homemade, homemade beef steak, fries. I mean, it had the whole works on there. And God says to Peter, help yourself. Peter says, I don't eat some of that stuff. I mean, I'm Jewish. I can't eat that. It looks good, Lord, and it smells great, but I can't eat it. God says, well, who says? God says, you don't call unclean what I've called clean. And, of course, Peter realizes later on that God wasn't talking about food, just food. He was talking about people. He was talking about Gentiles. Talk about dogs. Somehow God in his benevolence and grace had elevated dogs to the status of lost souls just like everybody else. And so we, we, we find that as we look at our story in Caesarea, God has called Cornelius to seek out Peter. While at the same time in Joppa, God has called out Peter to go and teach Cornelius. And God brings him, hey, listen, don't ever... Don't ever forget the fact that when you and somebody else meet and you have a chance to bring them to Jesus, God made that happen. Now, I don't know how he makes it happen. That's his business. But I don't believe things happen in life without purpose. And so if somebody crosses your path and they need the Lord in their lives, both of you need to be aware, believer and unbeliever, believer and seeker, you both need to understand that God's, God's doing something here. And the question we always need to ask is, okay, what's God telling me? That was the question Cornelius asked, and it's the question Peter asks. God rapidly and dramatically answers their questions. In the verses that follow, Peter comes to Cornelius' house. They sit down together. Peter teaches them about Jesus. And then next week, we're going to see the grand finale, which is just five short verses, but just rocks the world when they take place. It not only rocks the world, but we're going to find out in chapter 11, it rocks the early church. Because when Peter goes back home to Jerusalem, the first thing the Jewish Christians are going to say is, where you been? Oh, been to Caesarea. Why would you go there? Well, I went to bring a man to Jesus. Okay, who was it? Cornelius? Cornelius, I-U-S. Is that a Roman name? Yes, it is. He's a Roman centurion. He's a, he's a goy. He's an outsider. He's one of those dogs, but God taught me to bring him back. And they said, now, wait a minute, brother. We may have to break fellowship over this. Hey, you don't mess with God's fellowship. Amen. You don't mess with God's fellowship. It takes Peter, bless his heart. Chapter 11 is longer than chapter 10. It takes him a longer chapter to justify his actions to the church than it does for him to go and do what God wants him to do. Well, ain't that always the case? That always the case. It's harder to convince God's people than it is for, to convince God to do what God does. A couple of truths emerge out of this section we're going to look at today. The first truth I found in verses 22 to 29 is this. Human prejudices and human traditions have no place in the kingdom of God. There's no room for them. They just don't have a place. God says, my way or the highway. Now, we don't like that. But I'm going to tell you something. Presidential edicts don't change God's will. Directives from the U.S. Department of Education don't change the will of God. At some point, God's people decide, I'm going to serve God rather than men. I'm going to do what's right. Okay? The church is not designed for social engineering. The church is designed to follow Jesus, to serve God, to convert the lost to the will of God. That's what we're here for. It's very simple. We've stressed all through Acts, haven't we? It's so simple. Becoming a Christian is so simple. Actually, being the church is pretty simple if we'll just leave stuff alone and just do it God's way. And so we find that here. Because what Peter is going to run into, the minute he knocks on the door of the house of Cornelius, he is going to be confronted, he and Cornelius both, with a massive list of social and religious barriers that have kept these two groups of people apart for centuries. And in one beautiful moment, God just shatters all of it. So God sends Peter to Cornelius. Now, first of all, Peter goes into Caesarea. Jews don't go to Caesarea. That's a Roman governmental center named after the godless ruler of the empire. 
built by a man who was half Jewish but more, more kissed up to Rome than to God. They hated Caesarea. They hated all that it represented. They hated the Romans that lived and, and ruled from there. And so here the man who is the recognized vocal leader of the church walks through the gates of Caesarea following three or four pagan men to the home of this Roman centurion, perhaps within the actual barracks area of the Roman army, would be the likely place where he would live. So there we go. Peter walks in, and what does he find? He finds seekers. He finds, this blows my mind. He and some of the brothers, we find out later there were seven of them. If you go to chapter 11, there were seven brothers with him. And uh, there, well, six brothers. There were seven believers and three uh, emissaries from Cornelius. So ten of them. It says they got there the next day. It's 30 miles by foot. That's about an eight, nine, ten hour journey by foot, assuming you don't make any stops or anything. So it took them till the next day, but they get there. They walk into Caesarea. And they said Cornelius was expecting them. And look what it says in verse 24. He had called together his relatives and close friends. Now, how risky is that? This guy is a Roman. He is flirting around with this Christian movement thing that's just started up. By the way, the leader of that movement has just been crucified several months earlier by the Romans for supposed violation of Roman law. And here's this commanding officer in the Roman army inviting the leader of the Christian group that follows the crucified Jesus into his house to have a religious conversation. How crazy is that? And he not only does that, he invites his kinfolk in. He invites, he invites Aunt Maddie and Uncle, Uncle John and all them come in. And they're all sitting there. And I mean, hey, this is a preacher. This is like dying and going to heaven for a preacher. You walk in. The house is full of an automatic audience. They're all wanting to hear what you have to say. And the guy looks up and says, hey, let us have it. We want to hear. And it's like you want to say, I just died and went to heaven. You know, we didn't even have to do like we do you guys. We didn't have to get you in here with food during Bible school and then lock the door so you can't get out until church is over. I mean, it's amazing. So they come together, and he's got this whole room full of people who have a whole bunch of question marks floating above their heads. What is this guy going to say? Who's he going to talk about? Uh, God, uh, see, you, you know, Cornelius has to have told him his story. He says, hey, I've had a vision from God. There's a man from God coming to see me. And he's going to tell me what God wants me to do to really please God in my life. And, you know, you know that I'm a religious man. And you know that we've a lot of us have prayed together. And we've done a lot of benevolent things together. And listen, I want you to come and be a part of this. This man's the best evangelist the church has. And he's not even in the church yet. But he's, he's filled the room full of people. And they're all seeking God. Now, God's not going to turn his back on people seeking. He'll put you with somebody. Sooner or later. Now, the next two things that happen break down two massive social barriers. One is Roman paganism. The barrier of Roman paganism and the, the human tradition that seems to always focus on the idea of worshiping individuals. We tend to glorify preachers. We tend to glorify church leaders. We tend to glorify political leaders. We just, we really get attached to people. Unfortunately, sometimes to, <coughs> to the neglect of God. And so it says that Cornelius, it says as Peter entered the house, Cornelius fell at his feet in reverence. This will happen again in the book of Acts on several occasions. Because, the, and, and you know, we look at that and we say, oh, come on. But this is the way Roman people were raised. If you feel like there's any chance you're in the presence of a divine messenger, you assume the position. Not like this, but on your knees. 
because you, you want to show proper respect. He respects God, but he's showing it in the traditional way that you show respect for God in pagan cultures. And Peter refuses to be worshipped like a god. He says, get up, for goodness sakes, man, I'm just a man like you. I'm not, I'm not a divine, I, I don't have, now, keep in mind, Cornelius has already had a run-in with the divine messenger. Remember the, uh, remember the, the uh, angel that came to him and, and sent him to get Peter? Yeah, see, so he's already had a little dabbling with divine stuff. At this point, the man's kind of confused. He's not sure whether he's dealing with divine or human or both or none or, I mean, can you, can you see his confusion? Somebody says, well, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's because you've been raised in Christian circles all your life. But this guy's just making a natural reaction, and so he's, he's. Now, here's the other thing that's beautiful. Now it's Peter's turn to drop a wall. Listen to this. Peter said, stand up, I'm only a man myself. And talking with him, Peter, listen to this, went inside. Inside the home of a pagan, inside the home of a Roman, inside the city of Caesarea, inside a place that no respectable Jew would be caught dead. If Cornelius was not allowed to treat Peter like a god, Peter refused to treat him like a dog. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, why don't we let God do that in our world? Why can't we do that? Why can't, what, is, what is so hard to see in that? It's amazing how many social, economic, and racial games we play in the church, and they just don't have any place. The kingdom of God is just, it's for everybody. Well, you know, he's had a rough past. We've all had a rough past. Even those of us who have nice, clean noses and were raised in the church and raised on the church and grew up in the church and went to school in the church, I think sometimes we're more messed up than those of y'all that didn't. We've just got our own demons to deal with. You have to deal with guilt, and we have to deal with self-righteousness. And they both ugly. And they both take you apart. God just throws all that stuff out. God, God sees two kinds of people. There are only two kinds of people in the world as far as God, saved and the lost. And the saved need to be saved and stay saved, and the lost need to be reached by the saved and turned into the saved. And that's all God cares about. Because when he comes at the end of time, he wants to take his folks home. And he's not going to look up and say, now what was your zip code? What part of the country did you grow up in? What color are you? How much money did you make? None of that stuff is on the agenda. The only question God's going to ask you in the day of judgment is, do you know my son? Do you know my son? And just to make sure you're not lying to him, you look at his son and say, do you know him? Do you know her? Now, the reason I say that's because Jesus says, not every man who says to me, Lord, Lord, land the kingdom of heaven. They're going to be liars on the day of judgment. They're going to be people where God says, do you know my son? They're, oh, yeah, I know him right. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, I know that word. I just sing it every day. And he's going to turn around to his son and say, do you know him? And Jesus say, don't think we've met. Jesus says, if you don't do the will of the Father, you can Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all day long and we'll get you a thing. So, you know, uh, this human prejudice and tradition, the Jews have got to give up their hatred of the Gentiles. The Gentiles are going to have to give up their distorted view of divinity and reality. They're going to have to come to Jesus as who he is, and they're going to have to understand that the gods are no gods, and they don't work through special messengers. It's just going to be good old folks like you and me doing the will of God and sharing Jesus with others. And that brings us to our second point, which, which follows in the message that Peter delivers. And that is that regardless of the person, the message is always the same. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Gentile or Samaritan. It doesn't matter if you're male. It doesn't matter if you're female. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or educated or un. It doesn't matter whether you live in Palestine or, or 
Italy or Spain or the United States today. It doesn't matter whether it's 1st century or 21st century. None of those things matter. The message doesn't change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change, and his message doesn't change. You know? In fact, at the end of Acts 2, after they present the gospel for the first time, what does Peter say to the audience? He says, and this message is not just for you and your children, but to all those who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. What's, what's he saying? As long as people preach, if they preach the true gospel, and it's done the way it should be, you'll still get the same requirements and the same results on and on and on and on and on. And if you look at the book of Acts, no matter where they preached or who they preached to, same message, same requirements, same responses, same results. All the way through the book of Acts. Go to chapter 2, go to chapter 28. Same difference. It just stays the same. And it's really simple. It's really simple. Now, there's a lot here, but let's, let's go through it quickly because the message of, of Peter's pretty simple. So, but there are a couple of things. Both parties have to get to know each other. And I've got to believe that this first conversation was kind of like two porcupines in cold weather. They want to get warm so they get close and then they stick each other a little bit and they move back apart. So you got these two trying to kind of, kind of reach a kind of a rapport with each other. And so Peter says, uh, may I ask why you sent for me? So why am I here? It's interesting. God didn't say, I want you to go up there. Cornelius is going to be converted. I want you to preach the gospel to him and bring him to Christ. God never told him that. He just said, hey, a man's going to come and ask you to come to his house. You go. Have you ever been called by God to do something you weren't quite sure why? I hear people say all the time, well, I know I have a purpose here. I just don't know what it is. Give God some time. He'll open the door for you. Peter goes to Cornelius' house. He knows it's weird. He knows it ain't right. But he also knows God sent him. So it's like, okay, so now he asks Cornelius. He says, why, why am I here? And Cornelius says, well, I had a vision from God, and God I've been seeking God, I've been praying to God, I've been looking for God's will in my life, and God told me to send down and get you because he said, if anybody would know his will for my life, you would. And so basically what he says is, I'm yours, I'm open to you. Obviously, obviously whatever you tell me is going to be the truth because God personally told me to call for you. I don't think God's going to send me to somebody who's going to lie to me. So I'm open. Just tell me what God has to say. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful to meet somebody that, you know, Cornelius doesn't come to God with any agenda. Cornelius doesn't come to God and say, now listen, I'll listen to what you have to say, but I'm going to have to give this some thought now and decide whether I'm comfortable with it. Cornelius says, hey, you tell me what to do, I'm comfortable with it. This is the attitude of a true believer in the church, too, by the way. Whatever God says, you're comfortable with it. Why? Because God said it. God says it, I accept it, and that settles it. And it's still true. So, he says, I'm completely open. And Peter comes back and says, well, it's interesting that you talk about a vision from God, because guess what? I had one, too. I mean, we're like, we're like almost first cousins. We both had visions from God. God told you to send for me. God told me to go to you. And by the way, now I realize that big sheet with all those mixed foods was a whole basket full of people, including you, my friend. And you, and you are the social equivalent of a pork chop. <laughs> now you think about it. Cornelius is a human version of a pork chop. A Jew can't eat a pork chop, and a Jew can't get around a Gentile. God says, hey, you eat those pork chops. He says, okay, if you want me to. And God says, oh, by the way, bring that Gentile into the church, too. Now, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Unless you have the pork chop, you've got to take the Gentile. You know? It's kind of amusing. But you have to laugh at it because, I mean, it's, it, we're so used to, I mean, we're all Gentiles. Aren't you glad God let us in? Wow! Peter gets the point. He says, you know, you're open to God's will, and I accept all, all comers. In a sense, Peter has to be as open to the will of God as Cornelius is. And therein lies a message for the church. 
God is not only requiring openness to his will from seekers after him. He also expects those of us in the church to be willing to shift ground when God calls us to. We've got to have openness to God too. You don't come in, get it all right, lock in, and now you don't ever have to think about it again. We're all growing all the time. And I'm going to tell you something. There are going to be times in your life when God's going to lay claim to something in your life that you didn't realize was not in the will of God. And you've got to have the willingness of a Cornelius to say, hey, if it's God's will and he's shown it to me, I'll do it. I'm not comfortable with it. I get a little itchy when I get around it, but I'll do it because it's what God wants me to do. And then Peter shares the gospel with him. And guess what? It's the same message we've heard again and again. And it's still the heart and soul of who we are as Christians today. He says four things real quick. He says the ministry of Jesus was guided by the Spirit of God. He says, you know, Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed the hungry. He gave sight to the blind. He healed lepers. He walked on water. I've seen him do all of that. How can a man do all of those things and not be guided directly by the Spirit of God? And if that's not a stamp of approval from God, tell me what is. And this is what John says at the end of the Gospel of John. He says the purpose of miracles was not to impress people. It wasn't even to convert people. The purpose of miracles in the Bible was to authenticate. It was to say, okay, this guy, Jesus... He claims to be the Son of God. Big deal. Charles Manson claimed to be the Son of God. David Koresh claimed to be the Son of God. A lot of people claim to be the Son of God. A lot of people claim to be divinely inspired. Show me your credentials. Show me your credentials. Well, you know, if you can raise the sick, if you can raise the dead and heal the sick and restore the blind and walk on water and feed 5,000, hey, if you can do that and then die and be raised to life from the grave, I get it. Okay. What you got to say? If you say to me, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, I'm going to take that serious because that's coming from a man who raised the dead and healed the sick. Eh. That's pretty serious stuff. And so he throws that at Cornelius and he says, hey, you've heard about all this. Cornelius has been in Palestine long enough. He's heard the stories. He's heard the rumors. Then he proclaims the saving death of Jesus. He says it in a simple way. He says, yeah, he did all these wonders among the Jews. Oh, by the way, they killed him. But then at the end of his sermon, he mentions salvation in no other name. He had to die because the sacrifice was for our sins. But then he turns around and he says, I love the way he says it. And, and this is said a dozen times in Acts. He says, they killed him, but God raised him. They did what man wants, but... He ended up the way God wanted him to. By the way, if you stay faithful to God, you'll end up where God wants you to be. He'll get you there. He, he knows how to do that. You don't have to worry about all He knows how to do that. You have to trust him. And so, you know, you've got that going on. He says, he died for our sins. God raised him from the grave. And he says, by the way, we're witnesses of all of that. That goes right back to Acts 1.8. You shall be my witnesses. And so they're bearing, and by the way, the word witness here means eyewitness. I actually saw it. As old boy says, I see it and feel it. You know, he says, we, we sat down ate with him. So I know he was raised from the dead. But then he throws in this last little, you know, last little uh, twist on the, this is kind of the hook that grabs him. He says, oh, and by the way, one day you're going to have to answer to him for whether you follow him or not. Because God's appointed a day in which he'll judge the world through Jesus. And so he not only came to earth and was testified to by miracles. He not only died for our sins. He not only was raised by the power of God. He's going to come again. And when he does, you better be on the right side of the track. You better make sure that you've got a solid, faith-based, fact-based relationship with Jesus because he's not only here to save you, he's coming back to judge you. He's going to do it all. And who's better qualified? Who has, who has the right more than he does? He paid the price. So what do we learn from this passage? What does this passage tell me? When I, when I read these 20 verses, what do they say to me? 
Well, what they tell me is that all human opinions and practices must fall before the simple truths of the gospel. It doesn't matter how I was raised in the church. It doesn't matter what my folks thought or what my friends believe or what I've kind of uh, intuitively figured out. And that's not criticizing anybody. I mean, hey, God is going to judge each of us on the basis of what we know and whether we have followed his will to the best of our ability. But I'm going to tell you something. If you know what's right, you can't cop out on it. You can't go to God and say, well, I know that, but that's not the way I was raised. What does that have to do with it? Do you know how Cornelius was raised? He was evidently raised to be a good man. Would you agree with that? This man was raised with pretty good values. I wish, I wish most people I knew had the values that Cornelius had. Wouldn't you like to live next door to somebody that prays and takes care of his neighbors and is a good person and treats people right and is respected in the community? Wouldn't you like to live next door to somebody like that? We'd all like that. We'd be good neighbors. But God says, I want you to go get Peter because there's, there's a thing or two you're missing. You're missing Jesus. You're missing Jesus. Next week we'll look at what happens because in order to seal the deal, God has to do one more mind-boggling thing before it's finally taken care of. But then the command and the response are the same as always. Even when God does crazy stuff to get us there, he still requires us to do the same thing every time. It's amazing. So, you know, let's think about this. I mean, there, there's some challenges here for all of us. We've all, we've all got to rethink, you know, always. Am I, uh, the question every day, am I in the will of God? Am I walking in the will of God? Well, I, you know, you hear people say, well, you know, you shouldn't be treating people that way. Well, that's the way I was raised. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. Well, that's the way I was raised. Well, that's the way my daddy was. It's not good enough. Your goal in life is not to be like your daddy. Your goal in life is to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's a different story. Well, you don't understand how my neighbors are. Oh, I get that. That doesn't change what God wants of me. So if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, you're kind of flirting with the idea. It's okay. God loves you more than he can possibly. Well, God, God as one fellow said one time, God loves you this much. Or as a... Uh, as, uh, Casting Crown says, you know, as far as the east is from the west. I believe Isaiah said that first, didn't he? Yeah. How much does God love you as far as the east is from the west? Enough to put his son on the cross and shed his blood for you. Enough to raise him from the dead and give you the hope of heaven. Enough to send him back to heaven to prepare you a place. That's how much God loves you. Have you ever obeyed the gospel? Have you ever put your faith in Jesus? Have you ever repented of your sins? Have you ever been baptized for the remission to have your sins washed away? You ever confess Jesus as your Lord? It's real simple. That's what they do in Acts. That's what we're going to ask you to do if that's what you want to do today. If you're a Christian, your know, life's not where it should be. You want us to pray with you about it, we'll do it. If, if not, find somebody in this room that you trust and say, hey, step in the back room with me. Pray with me about my life. I need a prayer partner, just somebody to give me some strength. Accountability. Make yourself accountable to somebody to be stronger in your faith. If you're not where you should be, or if you just need prayer, we encourage you. Always stand and sing.